Um, today's reading is from Jonah, uh, the book of Jonah, chapter 4. I am reading from the Nas- um, New Living Translation. Jonah's anger at the Lord's mercy. This change of plans upset Jonah and he became very angry. So he complained to the Lord about it. Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this, Lord? That is why I ran to Tarshish. I knew that you were a gracious, compassionate God, slow to anger and filled with unfailing love. I knew you'd, how easily you'd cancel your plans for destroying these people. Just kill me now, Lord. I'd rather be dead than alive because nothing I predicted is going to happen. The Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry about this? Then Jonah went to the east side of the city and made a shelter to sit under as he waited to see if anything happened would happen to the city. And the Lord God arranged for a leafy plant to grow there and soon it spread its broad leaves over Jonah's head, shading him from the sun. This eased some of his discomfort and Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But God had also prepared a worm. The next morning at dawn, the worm ate through the stem of the plant so that it died and withered away. And as the sun grew hot, God sent a scorching east wind to blow on Jonah. The sun beat down on his head until he grew a faint and wished to die. Death is certainly better than this, he exclaimed. Then God said to Jonah, is it right that you were to be angry because the plant died? Yes, Jonah retorted, even angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, you feel sorry about the plant, though you did nothing to put it there. And the plant is only, at best, short-lived. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness, not to mention the animals. Shouldn't I feel sorry for such a great city? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Ian. I'm going to invite Wayne to come up now. It's lovely to have Wayne with us today um, as our mission partner with the Slavic Gospel Association, uh, looking after ministry to come up, Wayne, in uh, uh, in. Uh, Eastern Europe and through into the former Soviet Union nations. Um, so it's lovely to welcome you, Wayne, and uh, hear something of what you're involved in in your ministry there and uh, the support that we can offer to you. So let me just pray for you as you bring us God's word today. Lord, we thank you for Wayne. Uh, we thank you for your spirit that rests upon him and for the ministry of SGA. We pray that you will anoint him now as he brings us your word, uh, that you'll give him clarity in the message that our ears and our hearts will be open to receive from you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Stephen. Well, good morning, everybody. It's nice, nice to be with you. Nice to see some of you awake and joining in there. Anyway. Um, First of all, thank you so much for your prayers and support for the work of SGA. Um, SGA is a mission that's been in existence for nearly 80 years now, serving in Eastern Europe, uh, Central Asia, Stan Republics, Mongolia, and Far East Russia. I haven't been working with uh, SGA that long. I know I might look as if I have been, but um, I can assure you that's not the case. Uh, I've been with them about 11 years um, now. Thank you especially for your prayers and your concern and your support for what's going on in Ukraine. It's not reaching our news very often, but um, first of all, the discoveries of how brutal this conflict is are coming to light, and it's very, very disturbing. But secondly, this this conflict is, is likely to go on for some time. Please remember the churches and the pastors especially who have stayed behind to serve people and to serve the troops Uh, Many pastors are saying they're absolutely exhausted. I can't begin to imagine what that's like. Um, But also remember the surrounding nations, Romania, uh, Moldova, and other countries, uh, Slovakia, uh, that border Ukraine, that are taking people in, because churches in those zones are also exhausted because it's just relentless. It just continues all the time. I'm going to show two short videos in, in a moment, um, this morning, I thought I was going to take you to uh, Central Asia, which is why I've got a good excuse for my Central Asian hat. So we're going to look at what's going on in Mongolia this morning. So we've got two videos, one about a shepherd in Mongolia. But first of all, let's just see what God is actually doing in, in Mongolia, if we can have those videos on. We see enough bad news on the TV, don't we? But the thing to remember is that God is always up to something. 
And God is compassionate and caring. He is not willing that anybody should perish. And I remember as a teenager going to meetings with Operation Mobilization. It was sad to hear that George Verwer, the founder of that, died this week. But um, he's, he's in a far better place. But I remember sitting in those prayer meetings in the 1980s and praying that God would move across Mongolia. And at that time, we, we kind of thought it was impossible because it's so difficult to, to get in and do anything in Mongolia. That's still often the case. But um, let's just see a little project that is beginning to sow fruit and, and see things flourish. I hope that's uh, warmed your heart uh, a little bit. I'm quite tempted to leave this hat on, actually, because it's warming my head. Uh, But there we go. I've got one of those little radios here. And what SGA has done is teamed up with Transworld Radio and another mission partner, because the the work that's involved in Mongolia is absolutely huge, and one mission can't possibly do all of that work. I mean, SGA, there's only seven of us that do what I do. So we're only a short, small, short, small mission. We're only a small mission. Anyway, cut a long story short, um, uh, SGA has teamed up with other partners, and so radio and Bible teaching has been produced that is culturally relevant to the Mongolian people. This is then sent out across the radio waves, and it's especially important where people have no uh, mobile phone signals, but you can still get radio signals. They have no internet, but you can still get the radio. And these little radios are absolutely fabulous, because in the bottom of them, if I can get it out, there's a tiny little SD card. And these are radio SD card recorders. Now, if you're as ancient as as me, you'll remember radio cassettes. Yes, I I still use them. There we go, confession time. I still use cassettes. Anyway, the radio programs can be recorded onto those little SD cards, or when they receive their radios, they come already pre-packed on there. But then they can pass that SD card around to other people, and they can listen to it as well. And so the Word of God is actually going around. Uh, amazingly well by these little SD cards and as we can see by Jesus Jagger and his family the effects of the gospel are reaching people where there is no church and that reminds me that uh, we're very very blessed and fortunate to have churches in our area here in the UK I remember being in an overseas country a number of years ago and uh, one of the students said to me, you were a pastor once. I said, yes. And uh, he said, how many churches did you plant when you were a pastor? I said, I didn't plant any. He said, why not? And I was trying to think of some sort of excuse and some sort of reason to give that would be really worthwhile. And I said, well, actually, I I didn't need to. Why not? Everywhere needs a church planted. But I was trying to get across to him that in the UK, obviously, we do need church planting. But in the town where I am, I'm just so blessed with evangelical churches that the need for church planting wasn't there. So you and I this morning, I, I've just traveled down the road five minutes, but can you imagine traveling weeks if you wanted to go to the next nearest community? And that's what it would be like in places like Mongolia. So on behalf of Jesus Jagger, um, thank you for your prayers and your support of the work of SGA. Well, I know there's been a series being going uh, on with different Bible characters, and uh, I, I chose Jonah. One of the reasons I chose Jonah is he reminds me a lot of myself. Um, And as the story goes along, I'll I'll pick out just a few things. But my my sort of overarching theme for this morning is always love God more. Always love God more. Because what we see with Jonah is right from the very beginning, he doesn't want to obey the will of God. He's experienced God intimately in his life, and he actually testifies to that. And yet he doesn't want to have the privilege or the honor to take the blessings and the, the, the honor of God's name into the next nation. Well, we can kind of understand that with the Ninevites because they weren't too popular. It would be like God asking me, would I go to Russia and put a tent outside Moscow and just pray for Mr. Putin and try and approach him and say to him that you, you need to repent and turn to God. I would have other things on my mind right now than do that. I have to confess that when the invasion started last year in its main sense, the first thing I did was go on the internet and have a look on the Ukraine website about signing up. I thought, I can't just sit here, I have to get involved. And Iris, my wife, came along and said, what are you doing? And she had a look, she laughed. She said, you couldn't sign up, you'll be like Godfrey on Dad's Army. (laughs) And uh, well, anyway, the thing is that obviously I, I didn't sign up. but. I would rather do that than go and tell Mr. Putin he's wrong. 
I would rather see the judgments of God rather than the mercy and the compassion of God. And this is exactly the problem that Jonah finds himself in. He would rather see the judgment and the wrath of God on other nations that he despises than see the mercy and the, and the, and the compassion of God. And as I began to read this afresh, it made me think as well, do I want to see the judgment and the wrath of God? That sounds exciting, doesn't it? On my society, or do I actually want to get involved and see the compassion and the mercy of God? Many of us, when we read through the book of Jonah, we're taken up with this issue of the big fish or, or the whale. That's not a problem for me. If the Bible says it, then I take it as true. I don't have the authority to start changing the word of God and making it fit my ideas and my plans and purposes. There are other things in scripture we could think of. God created out of nothing. We just accept that. God parted the Red Sea for the Jewish nation to escape. God caused a flood and saved Noah in a boat. In the book of Daniel, we read how Nebuchadnezzar for, for quite a long time walked around on his hands and knees and his fingernails grew into like claws and his hair on his body looked like feathers. And you could look at that in the book of Daniel and think, what a load of rubbish, it must be a myth. But in the late 1940s, they discovered a disease called boanthropy that matched Nebuchadnezzar's disease. And yet we believe other things as well, like the virgin birth. We just accept that. We accept Jesus' miracles. He calmed the storm. He walked on water. We believe in his death and his physical resurrection. We believe in his ascension and his return. But when we come to the book of Jonah, somehow it makes us feel a little bit uncomfortable that God sent a fleshy submarine to rescue him when he was drowning. And we concentrate more on Jonah's whale than we do on Jonah's whale. Jonah makes this big effort of complaining to God, you know, I don't want to get involved with what you're doing. I don't want to see compassion and mercy. I want to see wrath. I want to see fire fall from heaven and brimstone and all this kind of action. And he completely misses, misses the point. And we get taken up very often in Jonah and the fish. But actually this story starts off with Jonah walking away from the presence of God. How can anybody in their right mind who has experienced intimately the presence, the word in the Hebrew language is panim, which means the very face of God. Here's somebody who fellowship with God, but when God said, will you go to the nation just next door? He said, oh, I'm not having that. And it says that Jonah ran away. He fled from the face of God, from the intimacy of God. He would rather run away from God than face what God is asking him to do. And it's interesting that the moment he starts running away from God, it all goes downhill. Quite literally, when you read the text, and it says, and, and Jonah went down to wherever it was he got the ship from. I can't remember, Joppa or somewhere. And then it goes down into the ship and he paid the fare. So he's even paying money to sin. I mean, not even a Jew would do that, would they? And yet Jonah runs away from the presence of God and it all goes down until eventually he gets thrown overboard and he's down in the ocean. He disobeys and he becomes a threat to others. He disobeys and he becomes a threat to himself. This is what it's like to live a life where you have no godly passion. And all that happens in just chapter one. And then in chapter two, we see God's mercy. As Jonah is thrown overboard, it's interesting how the pagan sailors get converted. So God is sovereign. When we come to chapter 2, Jonah is thrown overboard and this great fish that it says God has prepared swallows him up. You can look into the theological debates. I'm not too worried about that. I've read them. I'm not too impressed with, with many of them because they try and take away the miraculous. Where if you look at my life and what God's done in my life, it's nothing short of miraculous. And if I looked at your lives, I know that the change and the compassion of God is also nothing short of miraculous. I would imagine if we asked Stephen and said, when you were five or six years old, did you ever think you would be a vicar? Not at all. And ask me the same question, would I be a missionary overseas? Uh, not at all, I had other plans with my life. It's miraculous what God has done with each one of us. And as we see Jonah go into the depths of the ocean, I believe God is allowing him to see what it's like without God. He goes into the depths and he experiences the depths of death and hell, and he describes those experiences. And yet God's mercy is still in view. God's attention is still in view. God's provision is still in view. God's salvation is still in view. And God's release 
at the end of uh, chapter 2 is in view. Despite Jonah's running away, God just seems to follow him all the time. And I guess we could look at our own lives and see that as well. That the compassion of God is something that just seems to keep chasing us all the time. And then in verse 10 it says, once uh, Jonah had repented, it says then, the Lord commanded the fish and vomited Jonah onto the dry land. I can't imagine he smelled like Gavinci. He probably smelled like cod liver oil at the the very best and worst. But in chapter 3, it starts again. And God's command has not changed. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. A second time. You know, one of the reasons why I see a bit of Jonah in me, quite literally, in 1990, I finished my training as a naval architect and marine engineer. And I took a weekend off because... I was due to go to theological college and missionary training college when I'd left. But I spent the weekend in Swansea with some friends. And they had some tall ships in Swansea Harbour. And I sat on the harbour looking at these tall ships, just absolutely lusting after these wooden beasts of ships, just thinking, ah, beautiful, wonderful things. And I got talking to one of the captains. And he said to me, if you bring your sleeping bag and your passport here, we'll pay your passage to Australia I said, well, I've got a New Zealand passport so I can get into Australia. And I was working it all through. He said, if you bring that, we'll leave you with a lump sum of money so you can either fly back to the UK or settle in New Zealand or Australia if you want to. And I was thinking, you know what? Somebody else can go to missionary training. Somebody else can learn about the Bible. This is going to be so much more fun, so much more interesting. And then I got this sharp feeling in my rib and my friend was elbowing me like this and he whispered in my ear, Jonah, Jonah, See, I was literally about to jump ship the next day and he warned me about the storm and the ship could sink and I'll be on the bottom of the ocean or did I want to go to missionary college? Well, obviously I took the right decision. But you know, each one of us will have temptations that are relevant to what we think about to put us off what God wants us to do. And maybe Jonah was just thinking, I've not been to Spain for a holiday for a while because that's where Tarshish was. And he's just imagining the the, the beaches and the, the... the ice creams, I don't know if they have ice creams in Tarshish, but you, you know, that's what I'm kind of thinking. And you know, that seemed much more attractive than going to the Ninevites who would probably cut his head off. So he loses his head and walking away from God rather than losing his head in going to Nineveh. But God's compassion still follows him. And with all that going on, he, he preaches to Nineveh and the whole city gets converted. It is an absolutely extraordinary thing. It was the last thing that Jonah wanted. And yet when we come to chapter 4, we see the real heart of Jonah being displayed. A real heart of anger and displeasure. Somebody who is being close to God. Verse 1, he says this, I knew you were going to do this, but it greatly displeased Jonah that the city had turned to the Lord. He became angry. Verse 2, he prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord, was this not why I, what I said was going to happen while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish. There's this prayer of pride. I told you so. So if you've got no compassion from the Lord in your own life, you're going to answer back to him and say, I told you so. I mean, how can you say that to God? He's obviously so far in his thinking and so caught up with wanting the wrath of God on the Ninevites that he's just not there. And he uses this word, I told you so, because I know. Verse 2, I knew that you're gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and all these things. You know, the Hebrew word to know is yada. It's a very intimate word. It's not a head knowledge of, I've read all about it, so, you know, I know about it. It's an experiential word. When Adam and Eve first met in the Garden of Eden, the King James Version says this, Adam knew Eve. It's a beautiful way of saying that they came together physically and they couldn't get any closer than at that moment. And the Hebrew word is yada. They knew each other. They experienced each other. And it's interesting that Jonah uses that same word as his experience of God. I have known intimately that you're gracious. I have known intimately that you're merciful. I have known intimately that you are slow to anger. That's an interesting word in the Hebrew, slow to anger. It means somebody with a long nose. 
which is really strange, but it really means this, that if you get wound up and you go, and you, 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 your impulse to, to react straight away, but it's, God is more sort of, he just takes his time. He's slow to anger. Your loving kindness. Isn't it strange how he knows all these things intimately, but he doesn't want his experience of God to be transferred onto the Ninevites? Prayer of pride. Secondly, his prayer of what I call petulance. That's why I fled. He's just so, so childish about this. Like the prodigal son. You know, very often we think the story really is about the son who went into the world, but it actually the story, the emphasis is supposed to be on the one that stayed behind. And he did all the right things and he was self-righteous and full of himself. And that's why he never rejoiced. And I guess there's a bit of Jonah in that as well, that he doesn't want to rejoice in the fact that God's people who he created have come to him. And he doesn't want anything to do with that. His prayer of petulance. Thirdly, his prayer of pettiness. I knew you would relent. Or some versions say, I knew you would repent. It literally means, I knew, God, that you would change direction. And instead of wrath and fire coming down from heaven, you showed compassion. I knew that would happen. Fourthly, his prayer of pity. Three times in chapter 4, he says, I'd rather be dead than see you bless that nation. You know, I can't work that one out. I'd rather be dead than see you move. Although I have felt that towards Putin sometimes. And it, I was in a prayer meeting a little while ago and a little lady stood up and prayed and she said, Lord, would you show compassion and save Putin or would you shoot him? And I was thinking, shoot him, shoot him, shoot him. <laughs> but the prayer of many pastors in, in Ukraine is this, that if God works in Russia, we won't have to worry about peace in Europe. And if Jonah just had a little seed of compassion about God, he would realize that if God moved in Nineveh, then Israel would have peace. But he missed the point. So what does this word compassion mean? Well, there's a couple of words in the, the Hebrew language for compassion. And one of them means, or literally means, high cover. High cover. Well, how do we get high cover out of the word compassion? Well, it means to stoop down, to lift up and cover. You know, that's exactly what Jesus did on the cross. He became one of us. He stooped down. And with these hands, he embraced the cross until he was lifted up. And my sins, your sins, from the past, present and the future are covered because they were lifted up on the cross. And that's what God did for Jonah. And that's exactly what he did for Nineveh, high cover. The other word in the Hebrew language for compassion is womb. And you kind of think womb and compassion, how does that go? Well, because the Jewish people saw the womb as a place of compassion, a place of tender nurture, where life began to take shape, where life emerged and developed as its most vulnerable stage. But it would know warmth and comfort and protection. It would know the sustenance it needed in order to grow something healthy and to be able to give birth something healthy and honoring. Compassion. Two words, just two words for compassion. And as we come to the end of the chapter, verse 10, and Jonah's still complaining and saying, I'd rather be dead than can see the compassion of the Lord on the Ninevites. Verse 10 says, Then the Lord said, you had compassion on the materialistic things, the plant, which you did not work for and you did not cause to grow and came up overnight and perished overnight. Verse 11, and should I not have compassion on the vinegar to stoop down and cover and lift up, to provide a place like a womb where they can grow and develop into something healthy and honorable? where there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right hand and their left hand as well as many animals. And the, the whole feeling of right hand and left hand there is this whole sense of they're not turning to the right direction, either to the right or to the left. There is no spiritual direction for them. You see, when we really understand the compassion of God, we understand it as an action word, not just as a thought. And compassion, I, I'm very 
wouldn't, wouldn't head it as far as compassion as scripture is concerned. But I'll just leave you with this story of how I had to learn compassion. I was doing some postgraduate research in around about 2000 into some theological aspects. And so to support myself and my wife and, and young families, it was then I, I worked in a supermarket where very little helped. There were also other supermarkets, <laughs> but I have to work in this one. And I'd get on my little 50cc chicken chaser scooter because that was the cheapest form of transport. And I'd go in the evenings. I'd study during the day in Birmingham, come down and go off in the evening to, to work in this supermarket. And I hated it. I hated being on the till. And there were some people who knew me who would come in and see me on the till and they'd say, oh, fallen from grace, have we? Is that why you're sat here on the till? And I just, oh. And I remember one day just the Spirit of God saying, if you just change your heart, you'll see what I can do. So I, I apologized and I said, sorry, God, I'm, I've got a job. I can provide for my family. And then at that moment, I could hear a conversation behind me of this Dear lady saying, I've got such a terrible pain in my back. And this other lady on the till said, well, go and see Wayne, the guy in the front. He's got the fish badge on. Um, and he'll pray for you because he's a Christian. He's told everybody he's a Christian. Well, I felt I had to. You do, don't you? And I was thinking, what? What's she saying? So anyway, this lady picked up her trolley and came around to my bit. And she said, you're the man, you've got the fish badge. Will you pray for me? I said, well, yeah, I'll pray for you. I'll remember you tonight before I go to bed. No, now. I said, what, here? And she goes, yes. So put my hand on her shoulder, pray this really quick prayer, really annoyed, no compassion at all. And said, right, go, go, come on, go, go. Because the security camera's there and it's watching me. So she went. The next day she came in and she said, look, I can move. Oh, I said, oh, oh no. Because <laughs> usually, usually when I pray for sick people, they die. <laughs> and I'm quite happy with that. It's an easy answer. But now I knew I was in trouble because she told her friends. And her friends came into the supermarket and they went to the fish counter. <laughs> well, they would, wouldn't they? Because she said, you've got to go into Tesco's and see the man with the fish badge. So the fish man was always pointing, no, 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 you want to see Wayne, he's over there. <laughs> and people were queuing up, not because they wanted food, but because they needed compassion. And that was a really tough lesson for me, but I saw God move when I learned about compassion. When I stopped thinking about myself and my own materialistic thoughts and asked God, show me how you see these people. I had parents coming late at night to talk to me about their teenagers. I had Jehovah's Witness who came late at night when nobody else was watching him. I had so many opportunities. That was actually the best mission field I've ever been on in my life. The most exciting mission field because I never knew what was going to happen next. During that time, we, we lost a daughter to heart disease. And you should have seen God break out when that happened. What we thought was the disaster was the turning point for many people's lives. And we would just point them to the local church and they would just feed into their compassion. That's what Jonah missed in his character. He had all the knowledge and the experience of God and I've no doubt when he's under the water he could speak in tongue and all the rest of it. But that was just meaningless because he had no compassion. And as we leave here this morning, our mission field starts when we leave here. And are we going to take the compassion of Christ or like me, we just want to say, God, I want to see wrath and anger and justice. Well, actually, no, justice and mercy need to come hand in hand. And like God has shown me compassion, I want to see that compassion on my neighborhood. Thank you, Stephen.